Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to the Fire Pit 2020 Town Hall. We are here and we will be answering some questions that you have provided to us. All of the questions have been tossed into this hat, and we will be picking them at random to answer. Yes, the three of us have agreed to this amicable format with the hope of not being caught off guard by, you know, unscrupulous reporters. Liars! They're beautiful, sexy liars. Okay, that's a little awkward. So I've got the hat here. I'm going to go ahead and shuffle it around a little bit. And let's see, our first question... How will you serve as a mediator during your time in office? More specifically, how will you bring both parties to the table to come to a compromise on bilaterally divisive issues? Yes. Tom, hat's yours. Excellent answer. Brilliant. Okay. Oh, he even says, my question is for Tom. Well, that's nice. Okay. Being the most attractive of the candidates. (laughs) Well, this is true. How do you keep such composure when dealing with overly emotional and insincere opponents? Well, Anonymous, that's a very good question. I do it by keeping a cool, calm attitude when speaking to them, uh, acknowledging that, you know, maybe they don't get it right away. And also by being a genuine person and just having a strong, you know, unique platform. That totally wasn't planted. Yeah, how convenient. Uh, all right, my turn. Here you go. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. I got one. I got one. Let's see how, when elected, will you manage the financial defecate on your hands and wipe it on your face? That's a fair question. Dan? Uh, no, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm just, uh, well, I'm not surprised, actually. Trolls, I guess, were to be expected. I think I was just hoping for some level of screening before all of this was done. Moving on. Well, you know, you still got the hat. Why don't you just go ahead and pick another one since you got trolled? All right, all right, all right. I'll do this. Here we go. Let me see here. This is just a drawing of a penis. Poorly drawn one at that. Dan? I think that one broke Dan. He's just staring into the camera. Dan? Dan, hello? I I literally have no words. Why does a nicely drawn penis? Give me the hat. Okay, thank you. I'll just go ahead and draw another one. Here we go. How would you handle the issues with social media mismanaging the flow of information? Oh, God, no, no, no. Give me that. Give me that one. Like, uh, with the current trend in politicians and lobbyists, I mean, how would you best cradle the ball switch? Oh, for fuck's sake, Tom, just pick one. All right, all right. Calm down. Calm down. You know, not all these could be gems. I mean, Tom, what conditioner do you use in your hair? It's so luscious and full every time I see you. I have to agree. They're definitely not wrong. Well, thank you, Josh. I try. Well, you know, it is just all about how much love you give it. Not necessarily a product, but yeah, also lots of conditioner. Lots of conditioner. And do not go cheap. If it's got only like This a is one- bullshit. Give me that hat. That, look, look, I just, let me... <sighs> well, at least the veins add a good amount of detail. Tan is having all the luck today. Let me try my turn at the hat again. All right, here's a good one. Um, I hope. Given current trends in property taxation and monopolistic tendencies of corporations, how would you promote their expansion with minimal impact to the tax? Dan, here, take the hat. I think you should have another try at this. This is beyond stupid. <sighs> yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Not only are we taking Jake Martell to Midnight Special America, but we're going to take Kirsten Dunst to Wag the Dog, and then Willie Nelson to Swing Vote, Dennis Hopper to Cool Hand Luke, George Kennedy to Flight of the Phoenix, then all the way to Jimmy Stewart to Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Yeah! Grab your tiny flag 
and hop on the bandwagon because we're hitting the campaign trail. Join Dan, Tom, and Josh on their Whistle Stop campaign trail. Shaking hands and kissing babies all the way to Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Ask not what the fire pit can do for you. Ask what you can do with the fire pit. You're going to get used to wearing them chains after a while, Luke. Don't you never stop listening to them clinking. Wish you'd stop being so good to me, Captain. What we've got here is failure to communicate. Good evening, Matson listeners. Welcome back to the Fire Pit. I'm Dan, a parliamentary named Nigel. And what a classic night it's going to be. We've evaded police, we've covered up a scandal, and we even saw the postman deliver a vote. <laughs> Get it? Because Kevin Costner was in the... Anyways, it's okay, it's okay. I hate myself the most. But back to prison we must go, because it honestly wouldn't be a campaign trail without at least somebody going to jail. So as per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved him on to this one. And now to tell us what we're watching and who we're watching, the floor recognizes Josh. Thank you, Nigel. Good evening, voters and fellow members of Congress. I am Reginald, congressional name Josh. And last week, we watched Kevin Costner meet a host of celebrities, including Willie Nelson, in the mediocre swing vote. The red-headed stranger was working hard to get the Mariner to vote for his old smoker rival, Dennis Hopper, who we will follow tonight into Cool Hand Luke, a classic film from 1967, starring not just Dennis Hopper, but the one, the only, Mr. Paul Newman. And to give us a better rundown of the film, the motion has passed to the junior editor from Ohio. Tom, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Josh Thompson here, Senate name Tom. And as mentioned, we're watching Cool Hand Luke tonight. How, how's that? How's that for my Senate voice? You know, that's it's, terrible, it's, but it's, keep going. Veto, veto, veto. The floor does not recognize the parliamentary Dan. But while no animals were harmed in the making of this film and no parliamentary members were harmed in my Connecticut accent, many eggs were eaten and... Now that's yeah, I think some milk was drank too. It's been a while since I've seen this one. Cool Hand Luke was released November first, nineteen sixty-seven. Has a running time of hundred and twenty-six minutes. The budget for the time was three point two million, nineteen sixties money, and had a box office of sixteen point two million dollars. Also 1960s money, so still pretty good. It currently holds a 100% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes with a 95% audience score. I tried to look to see what it was released against and how it compared its opening weekend and such, but this was one of those films that was too far back for box office mojo. This is another movie that's based on a book. Um... Book itself based in the 1950s, uh, written by Don Pierce, who wrote it based off his own experience serving as a chain gang in Florida prison for counterfeiting and safe cracking. In fact, the sets on this film were designed after the prison that he served time in. This movie was nominated for several awards, but only one for two, both of them going to George Kennedy for Best Supporting Actor, uh, Academy Award Best Supporting Actor, and the Laurel Awards for Top Male Supporting Performance. Newman won none of them, which kind of seems a shame, really, considering his pedigree before this film. Now, just as a background, this film actually... Another one of those pseudo-indies for its time, uh, the director, Stuart Rosenberg. Uh, he was mostly known for TV series and movies like Rawhide and Untouchables. His only movie before this was Murder Incorporated. Uh, so he just did Crimes Dramas, the producer, Gordon Carroll. Uh, only two films, um, How to Murder Your Wife, a Jack Lemmon comedy, and Love, which was a film about suicide and romance. 
uh, writers were, you know, of course, the book writer himself, uh, Don Pierce. Well, actually, I think was in this film, and this was his first screenplay. You had Frank Pearson, who also mostly just comedies and cowboy films. Um, Hal Dresner, also his first film. The actors, Paul Newman, he was the draw back in the 60s. He was box office gold. He was sex appeal and just everything. He he always played charismatic criminal types with a dark streak, uh, the hustler, the long hot, hot summer. He plays Luke in this one. George Kennedy, who we most of us would know from The Dirty Dozen as Major Max Armbruster. I know him uh, as from Delta Force. Really? Was he in Delta Force? Yeah, he's the priest on the plane when the plane gets taken hostage. So, yeah, George Kennedy's in Delta Force with Chuck Norris. So. Oh, no kidding. Oh, fun. I didn't know that. Well, nice. He plays another prisoner, Dragline, in this one. He's mostly a character actor. Strother Martin plays the captain, the bad guy. Also, mostly Westerns, mostly character actors. And, of course, Dennis Hopper, up until this point, not much. He was mostly in television, really. So this was more kind of a him stepping up. The only film he had really done before this, aside from a B film called Night Tide, where he falls in love with a mermaid serial killer. Or serial killer mermaid. Um, the only film before that, before this, was the trip where he played a uh, drug user. So most of the people in this one, with the exception of Paul Newman, were kind of unknowns and first timers. But really, I mean, come on, Paul Newman, just Paul Newman. So if you were back in the 1960s, this is what you were going to see, and you knew what to expect from his films. But what about us, gentlemen? Real quick, this, I did yeah. wanna I did some back of the napkin math for the box office, you know, adjusting for inflation. But the movie was made on three point two million dollars for nineteen sixty seven. Yeah. That's almost twenty five million dollars in today's money. Oh so wow. still even so it's still even a movie made for I think what was it Tom Hanks movie, the Apple T V plus movie he made was uh, made for like forty five million and that was considered a very, very thin shoestring budget. Not mm-hmm. saying it's a cheap movie, I'm just saying it was cheaply made. But and a movie on this list Midnight Special cost $18 million to make. Yeah. And it made double its budget. I mean, it, this it, one, though, like the $16.2 million in 2020 <laughs> money, that's $126 million. So on a $25 million budget, it made $126 million. It made $101 million. That's a good, ta- that's a good takeaway. Oh, man. Not, not bad for an indie drama starring a bunch of nobodies. Yeah. <laughs> no, right? Seriously. But we know what's going into this film and what. Uh, was done to make this film so nigel what are your expectations for this is this your first time seeing this or have you seen this before i haven't seen this movie since maybe high school and even then i haven't seen the uncut like video version of this movie i don't think i've ever seen it the only time i've ever watched this movie once is when it was on tv um so i've never seen it uncut and i don't think i've actually seen it all the way through like i've seen like parts of it and then you change the channel and you watch it a little bit more or whatever so i'm looking forward to seeing this um i will say this to our younger audience members out there and our our bots that were just programmed yesterday you may not know this movie but i guarantee you know a line from this movie it's this movie is the home of the famous line what we have is a failure to communicate that's a line that has been often parodied often imitated often homaged in lots of different hollywood productions yeah misattributed Mm. too because other movies have made that line and people have mistakenly quoted that from a different movie that was paying homage to this movie yeah um i even said at work today that this movie is the home of that line and someone's like i thought that line came from full metal jacket because it sounds like something the Arlie Ermy drill instructor would have said in the movie, but he mm-hmm. never he doesn't say anything close to that in that movie. That mm-hmm. line is from this movie. What we have is a failure to communicate. And it's, it's a classic line. Oh yeah, it's, it's funny on that one too. They almost cut that line. They thought it was too smart for the character. Yeah, right. So my expectations are pretty high going into this movie. I mean, it's considered a classic. It's so far now the highest rated film we've reviewed on this podcast. It's got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. And that's really hard to do. Even like, I think Apollo 13, which is a very beloved movie, only had like a 97 or 98%. I think Toy Story and, 1 and 2, last I checked, had 100%. Yeah, like 100% is, is really hard to do on Rotten Tomatoes because Rotten Tomatoes is critic scores and audience scores, and the audience is like 95% for this movie, and the and critic scores are 100% for this movie. 
It's like that that's every so critic that watched it. It's not necessarily a ten out of ten movie. That just means every critic that watched it liked it. Yeah, mm-hmm. which means there's no contrarians in the group. There's not one person that doesn't like this movie just to be different and say I don't like it. So they sound like the smartest guy in the room. So that's kind of impressive. Um, <laughs> Well, sorry, you have something stuck in your throat there, yeah, Josh. Sorry, I think it's the COVID. Okay, well, let's um, why don't you go ahead and quarantine for 14 days and stop talking? <laughs> but no, seriously, minutes. my expectation, <laughs> my expectations are really high for this film. I've not seen it all the way through. I've only ever seen it on TV. It was one of my grandparents' favorite film, one of their favorite films ever. So my expectations are really high. I'm really hoping to enjoy the hell out of this film. Plus, it's it's kind of cool going back to the 60s, and we haven't been there since. Actually, this is so far the oldest movie we've, we've done, isn't it? 1967, I think so, actually, unless yeah, we're missing one. No, Swashbuckler and Jaws were like 75 and 76, yeah. so... Of course, that, it's, it's only a record that it's going to hold for a week. <laughs> and then it's going to get broken, and then that one will get broken the week after that. Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> but my expectations are high, and... With my expectations now being recorded, I will go ahead and let Josh break his 14-day quarantine and give us his expectations. I'm going to cough all over what you're eating right now as you put the food in your mouth. Um, I'm not eating anything, though. Aha! Damn it. You got me. I I don't have a comeback for that. Title your sex tape. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, okay. So uh, this is one of those movies... I have never sat down and watched. I have heard about it, that it's an amazing movie. Um, I mentioned before that I have known people who've named their kids after the characters in this movie. But I have never watched it. I've always wanted to watch it. It's been one of those movies that I've always wanted to watch. I even got the movie with the intent of watching it, but it collected dust. And that's my own fault. I don't watch a lot of movies from the 60s or 70s, for that matter, that aren't, you know, Star Wars. Or maybe Planet of the Apes or whatever. Maybe it's just like that I'm discriminating against the movie because it's made in the 60s, just unconsciously. But I don't I really want to see this movie. So when I saw this movie on the list, when I was picking this list, I was just like, I need this list to win because I really want to watch this movie. But I need a reason to watch this movie. So I'm really glad I got picked. I have super high expectations for this one. And I'm really hoping and expecting it to maintain those uh, or meet those expectations, if not exceed them. Because it's like I said, it's one of those things. I don't think I know anybody who's seen this movie say a bad thing about it. And I really wonder, because, Dan, when you mentioned that you'd seen it on TV, I wonder if I've ever seen part of it and just kept flipping through the channels without acknowledging that that was Cool Hand Luke. So I may have seen bits and pieces of it. But as I sit before you right now, I have not seen this movie. I think you would know if you'd seen it. There is a lot of shirtless Paul Newman in this film. Just like... Uh, keep in mind, when we watched Stand By Me, episode one of our uh, field trip to Kingtown, I uh, said I hadn't seen that movie. But as we were watching it, I was like, oh, yeah, I did see this movie. So it's a possibility it's one of those films that, yeah, at least watch for a bit, but maybe your mind was preoccupied or something else pushed it out. And you'll, you'll figure out halfway through, it's like, oh, yeah, I did see this film. Given my history of us watching these movies, I'm definitely not pushing that out of the realm of possibilities that I have seen this movie. Right. Call this the me trying to call it beforehand so I don't look like an idiot after. <laughs> Way to cover your bases. You are that's a good a, politician. Man. That's that's a good endorsement from Tom. See, you heard it here. But anywho, Tom, I do appreciate your endorsement. So I endorse you giving your expectations next. Oh, I graciously accept your endorsement. Thank you. And this is going to be the second time for me seeing this. I rented it a few years back back because it was one of those films that I always said I want to see because it's on every critic's like top 100 list. I'm like, okay, I want to see what this is about. And I was not disappointed then. I'm definitely not going to be disappointed now. I'm looking forward to paying a little more attention maybe to Dennis Hopper's character, Baba Lugas. I, I can't remember, pronounce that name. And just see how it stacks up. I think... For your side, Josh, I do understand your reticence in watching 1960s films because there is a certain hippie stigma to those where it's just, you know, you think of that, you think maybe Austin Powers-ish. This is not one of those. This is a very social commentary kind of film. Well, I don't know if you would say it was a social commentary, but it's a similar vein as Shawshank Redemption. It's just showing the not-so-fair or pretty side 
of the prison system. Some great scenes, great character work. I remember the first time I saw it. Um, I think I didn't watch it straight through, though. I think it was one of those situations the first time where I watched a bit, then I had to stop because work or whatever, and then I watched it again later and finished it up in pieces. So seeing it all the way through will be nice. And maybe a little more appreciation just for the gorilla style of directing and also just keep watching you guys enjoy it too. Cause for me, it's not just rewatching a good film. It's rewatching a good film with people who haven't seen it before, or it's been a long time seeing it. I will get osmosis joy from this. I think that's really about it. And also just appreciate, you know, Paul Newman in his prime, you know, that swarthy, sex appeal Paul Newman just oh, yeah, charming as hell that, yeah that's another thing for our, our younger audience Paul Newman used to just not make salad dressing he made movies lots of them and mm -hmm. he was like a sex appeal or a sex god when in the 60s like my mom says she literally doesn't know any woman that didn't have a crush on Paul Newman yeah yeah and for those who watch it and uh, like shirtless Paul Newman sweating it up in the sun you, you're gonna get that you're gonna get all of that I promise you. Keep in mind, a lot of our younger listeners may know Paul Newman as the voice of Doc Hudson from the movie Cars. That's right. He was, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. He is in Cars. That's right. He is in Cars. Good uh, connection there, Josh. I forgot he was that character. Yeah, well, I am good with trivia and tidbits. What a wonderful segue. Let's <laughs> go ahead and do the quiz stuff with Josh then. And hopefully, hopefully... It is in a complete and total out of control grease fire that mine was last week. Well, I've got some great news for you because this week I plan on doing an even worse job than the previous two weeks combined. Let me get my <laughs> drink ready, guys. Stand by. Yeah, but I, not think really. I, need I think I need something stronger than this Mountain Dew. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm actually kept it pretty simple. I went back to the reviews, but I changed it up just a hair. So. This week, I'm going to read you a line of a review. It's either going to be a review of Cool Hand Luke or another Luke movie. Oh. So it's basically a yes or a no, kind of a true or false type thing. However, on the event of a tie, if it's not Cool Hand Luke, if you can guess the name of the movie, you'll get a bonus point. And then if we still tie it up, then we'll go back to our ratings. Like whoever gets closest ratings will get that point. Okay. So just to make sure I'm on the same page. So you're going to... Give um, the review, and we have to say, guess that's Cool Hand Luke, or no, it's not Cool Hand Luke. Yes. So yes. it's it's not a grease fire. It's a dumpster fire. It's still a blaze. It stinks, but at least it's more controlled. It'll keep us warm. That's all that we need right there. Get us through the... Get us through the dumpster the fire is only terrible when and where. I mean, if it's middle of December at 2 a.m., you want a nice warm dumpster fire. That's true. That's true. All right. So question number one by Axstasis. And I did make a point to pull a line out of all of these reviews where Luke is referenced. On many occasions, the motivation behind Luke's actions are dubious at best. But this all adds to the lure of his en enigmatic personality. Is this just, review a review of Cool Hand Luke or not? Oh, is this like where we like ring in and we guess or? Well, I'll give it to Tom since he was the gracious loser last week. Oh, thank you. And I'm going to have to say no, this is not Cool Hand Luke. And I will say that this is Cool Hand Luke. It is Cool Hand Luke. Point to Dan. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. He gave it an 8 out of 10. Nice. All right. So question number two. Luke actually plays more the straight man, if you can believe that. But it works well in context. Dan? I'm going to say not Cool Hand Luke. <sighs> I'm probably going to get it wrong, but I'm going to say it is Cool Hand Luke. It is not Cool Hand Luke. <laughs> get you your head in the game. You want to take a wager on what movie it is. Star Wars. No. Uh, Luke is the straight man. I honestly, I'm drawing a blank. Dukes of Hazard, 2005. Oh, that makes sense. I did. Yeah. We can have dumpster fires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's two points to Dan. All right. Question number three. Luke is barely flawed. 
and the few flaws he had disappeared within the first 15 minutes of the movie. Is this a review of Cool Hand Luke, Tom? No! No, not Cool Hand Luke. You're both correct. Do you know what the movie is for a tiebreaker? Star Wars. Star Wars. Which one? Uh, A New Hope. Tom? Um, Yeah, I'm going to say New Hope as well. You are both correct. Since we're fully tied up on question three, let's go ahead and go back to our rating review. What did L-Man, I didn't say his name at the beginning of this question, what is his review of Star Wars A New Hope? So you were saying that he had barely any flaws for the first 15 minutes, but no flaws at all. I'll read it for you. Luke is barely flawed, and the few flaws he had disappeared within the first 15 minutes of the movie. And this is out of 10, so I'm going to say a 3. Nigel? Uh, I'm going to say 6 out of 10. And it goes to Nigel. It is an 8 out of 10. (laughs) (laughs) Woohoo! Trust! (laughs) Now who's grabbing dicks? (laughs) (laughs) Serves you right for giving yourself all them softball questions at the town hall. Uh... All right, this one... I have the same question twice. Okay, so I actually grabbed a bunch of them. It's Star Wars. He gave it an 8 out of 10. Ah, I got the question right! Good job, Dan. And the points to you. Bullshit! I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. No, I just, I think I accidentally copied and pasted the question twice. I only picked five total, but uh, I did have extras in case of a tiebreaker. All right, so this one is by Mike52 AD. He said. Luke, the main character, is a larger-than-life person in one respect, and yet he is a loser. Dan, I believe this is to you. I'm gonna... Luke is a larger-than-life figure, but he's also a loser? It says, Luke, the main character, is a larger-than-life person in one respect, and yet he is a loser. I'm going to say not Cool Hand Luke. Oh, this absolutely is Cool Hand Luke. And points to Tom. It is a Cool Hand Luke review. Mike 52 AD gave this a 10 out of 10. Mm, Nice. All right, so our final question, even though we technically don't need to do this because Dan won, is by Fatterson. Is it Fatterson or Fatterson? Yes. He said, imagine an ugly character playing the part of Luke. Would this movie have been such a huge hit? I'm certain it wouldn't. This is Cool Hand Luke. This is absolutely cool, Hank Luke. Did you not hear us 10 minutes about shirtless Paul Newman? I mean, come on. You are both correct. Now, what did Fatterson give as a rating for Cool Hand Luke? Nigel, you want to go first? Eight out of 10. Thompson? Four out of 10. Thompson was closer. He gave it a one out of 10. This guy's an idiot. Tell me about it. Jesus, God. So the final tally is Dan three, Tom two. So, once again, Tom with the losing streak. Yeah, where's that one town hall about me having great hair? I need to <laughs> I need to solace myself. <laughs> but yeah, it's like I did pick a couple out of Dukes of Hazard. I was going to actually get some bit of trivia on like Luke Wilson, but I'm like, it's only five questions. I want to make at least three of them for Cool Hand Luke to be relevant. Like, I was going to do a gimme question, and that was going to be, how low can you go? A crappy jackass actor to play a lovable Luke. This sickens me. No, <laughs> that would have been a dead giveaway for Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. Yeah. But would you have gotten it without knowing that I, I said that? That that might have been more of a hint because I know that what's his name from Jackass was in Dukes of Hazard. I just yeah. don't know what I don't remember what character he played. I would have got Duke. it wrong. I would have I can already tell I would have got it wrong. Or this am... was the other one that I was gonna do is uh Luke was the more responsible of the two and would never run around. And Jesse would never take part in the violence at the end of the movie. Yeah, that's um that's um that's Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they t- just told you they were both Dukes of Hazard, But yeah, so that was my quiz. Hopefully it wasn't as bad as the previous two weeks. But the last one wasn't so bad, just long. Like I said, I thought Dan's would have been a lot better had the questions been a little bit more reined in. Uh, well, now they'll be out of control. <laughs> Gosh, what have you done? I you have a list even... of 473 people who are unaccredited in this movie. Ten. I need you to delay at least 200, or Ten. we're not watching it. Ten questions, all essay. <laughs> <laughs> you gave him a second term, you moron. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. 
I feel like Jafar at the end of Aladdin. I'm about to be like, I'm a genie now and I have all this power, but I haven't been sucked into the lamp yet. And my plan hasn't backfired horribly yet. Yet yeah, being the, opposite. it's about to though. It's about to though. I haven't, yes. well, thought, Dan, I haven't we are trusting you with the quiz next week. Don't fuck yeah. it up. Actually, I have gotten some feedback, not just from you two crazy cats, but some of our other friends on discord and Facebook Speaking of which, join our Discord and Facebook. I don't know if I'm going to go back and do the reviews again, but I'm definitely not going to do what I did last week. And I'm just going to tool it a little bit in, yeah. in tune. Like I said, so, I think that would have been it would have been really good. It's just you left the questions too open ended. Yeah, and you're right. Like you know, oh, all these movies that we're not watching tonight. Name them and the actors in them. And I'm like, Dan, what were you thinking? And I remember that my work training has fried most of my. My, the right hemisphere of my brain, so only the left hemisphere was able to do the trivia last week, and it showed. Yeah, don't you just love when work mode kind of creeps into podcast mode? Yeah, yeah, and it ruins both, <laughs> so <laughs> good job on the quiz tonight, though, Josh. It was creatively done, and I did enjoy it, so. Well, thank you. I? Yes. I guess after that's over with, uh, the only thing we have left to do is... Hey, Josh, I think I see a question written directly to you in the hat here, and this one looks like a short one. Um, like, here, please, you please, want to... Here, come here. Don't be a dick. Don't be a dick. Don't be a dick. Don't be a dick. Tom, play the music. Welcome back to another rhetorical episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and debate moderator, Tom. Now, I expect a good, clean debate, and don't make me use my mute button. I'm crazy enough to do it. <clears throat> Thank you again for joining us on the Whistle Stop campaign trail as we stump for the prison votes with Cool Hand Luke. Uh, you know, every vote counts if we want to make it all the way to Washington. Mr. Smith goes to Washington, that is. Oh, and speaking of debates, I'm being told we have some breaking developments in the fire pit elections. And welcome to our second attempt at a town hall. Hopefully this one goes a little bit better this time. Can we not? This is stupid. Well, uh, we, we tossed out all of the questions, and we replaced them, so hopefully we have better ones. Dan, do you want to take the first one? Huh? What? Oh, no, no. I want no part of this shit show. Tom, you go. Oh, all right. Let me see. Okay, all right. Um. Oh, Mine! This looks like a Mine! Mine! Ha-ha! <laughs> Mine! What is your stance on the legalization of prostitution and taxation therein? Your mom would single-handedly pay back half the country's debt. Ha ha. A your mom is a whore joke. Super classy. Didn't know our listeners also played Xbox Live. For the record, my mother is a wonderful woman. And you should be ashamed of yourself. And now, I'm done. Tom, take the hat. Well, that went... Something. Mm -hmm. That's to me then. Thank you. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Okay. Oh, ooh. I like the paper on this one. All right. <clears throat> Another one directly to me. Okay. Tom has such a way with his speaking. His use of the English language is as eloquent as his posture. No question. Just wanted to point that out. Oh, thank you. That was nice. I oh. like that. How is this happening? Like, he's had every goddamn softball question that we've had. Let me Since try it again. T Tom, give me give me the hat. Give me the hat. Mm, careful now. Don't, don't be grabby. Okay. Here. Let me see. All right. With the current climate, especially relating to the pandemic, recent protests, and the debate on gun control. Nope. Dan, take the hat. You get to go again. All right, all right, all right, all right. Well, at least it's boobs this time. No, wait, hold on. Let me turn it upside. No, it's another dick. All of this has been dicks. Every goddamn question I've had has been dicks. Seriously, I'm tired of this shit. 
yes, this is exactly what we have come to expect from politics in the 2020s. But if you happen to have a question for the candidates, or just a question in general, or want us to say something about your products, feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just put fire pit in the subject line, as well as what you're emailing about. Suggestions, advertisements, commissions, remissions, retractions. And tell us what you have, and we'll read what you have, and never let you know what we thought. I mean, you know what you said. Why rehash the past? That email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Boop! And I'm getting the signal that time's up. Hope you paid attention because there will be a fill-in-the-blank quiz in the next few weeks on this. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. Is he stealing parking meter money? You're not late on paying the meter if there's no meter. He is no? a individual, isn't he? Just look at that smile and that chin. I mean, how could you not? It's like sexy Squidward. <laughs> he does look like sexy Squidward. Holy shit. It was a drunken mistake, officer. Sir, you did 37 of them? At some point, you had to have sobered up. Nope. Wasted the whole time. Oh, take it off slow, drag line. Now tell us something about that zoom there, Tom. No. Well, that was a zoom. I feel smarter already. I just want to know why the guy who committed manslaughter only got two years, but the guy who did breaking and entering got five. So wait... You're telling me if I'd have just killed the guy on accident, I would have got less time? We don't care if you kill another person, but by God, do not damage property. When I grow up, I want to be Paul Newman. I'm the titular character. Of course I'm going to be an issue. You know, honestly, George Kennedy was a handsome man, too. Just saying, maybe it's the fact I'm in a prison full of dudes. Changes a guy, but there's some good-looking men in this movie. Prison changes a man. I remember when we did the line of cocaine that got you sent to prison. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time. Wasn't until I realized it wasn't cocaine. It was baking soda. I don't know what cocaine is. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently selling it and acting like it's cocaine will get you arrested. I don't know what cocaine is. That's a rich man's drug. Was that the guy who had like the heat stroke? Yep. So his punishment for having heat stroke is to spend a night in a box? That fair, just southern prison system. I'm getting some mild, basic training flashbacks. Dude, I know. I'm like, this isn't that bad. This is almost exactly like basic. Yeah. This is, this is like your guys' story every prison movie we watch. <laughs> Josh, were we in prison? I think we were. What is his accent? Is she taking a selfie? No, it's called a radio, Josh. I know. It's on her phone, right? Josh, this is the 1960s. Got awfully quiet in the chat here. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want me to unmute so you can hear me touching myself? <laughs> My breathing got heavier. I mean, you know. I just hate it whenever the woman's on screen. <laughs> she know what she's doing. No. I think she knows exactly what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> we think like Paul Newman. I would love to subscribe to her Instagram page. I admire her car washing technique. Is that would what definitely be on OnlyFans. Symbolism. <laughs> More symbolism. <laughs> oh, it's literally a safety pin. So much symbolism. Taking them off here, boss. <laughs> Zip. <laughs> <laughs> Taking it out here, boss. Take it out there, Dan. Stroking it out here, boss. <laughs> Stroking it out there, Josh. Flipping the yogurt here, boss. Flip the yogurt there, Josh. I love how they do that. They cut from boobs being pressed up against the window to a group of men in a shower. Hand like, check. Well, and it's harder now. I mean, <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> Can't they need a cold shower? Go on. <laughs> you see a whole bunch of sheets moving up and down. <laughs>
More like cool hand job, Luke. Hey! <laughs> yes, that was good. I have my moments. Oh shit, we forgot about the guy in the box. <laughs> How many days has it been now? Two, three. Yeah, he's dead. Some of these guys got the same look on their face they have when they were watching Lucille. <laughs> I know I do. Shirtless Paul Newman and shirtless George Kennedy. I didn't hear no bell. <laughs> I've got you right where I fought you. Just lured you into a false sense of security. Now like, stop moving and let me hit you. Stop, stop, he's already dead. I wanted to destroy something beautiful. Two points to Josh. I know I've seen in him something. The really jacked guy? Yeah. Well, I doubt you remember him, but he was one of the um, aliens on the original Star Trek that had his face painted half white and half <gasps> black. No shit! That's him? Yeah. Uh, let that be your last battlefield. He was... <sighs> Sounds like we're losing Josh. Uh, Quick, give more facts about him. Okay, I gotta hit the head. <laughs> Keep it playing. Boy, Tom's got to hit the head every time that they're getting in bed in their tidy whities Yeah, I'm um, noticing the pattern as well. Of all the things I was expecting of this film, this was not a subplot that I would have imagined. Really? This is one of the most famous subplots in movies. The Luke eating the eggs? <laughs> I've honestly never heard about it before tonight. Hmm. You need to be more cultured. Reminds me of a time my friends bet each other $20 that one friend couldn't chug a gallon of milk in an hour. Oh, God. So we did it. And then threw it all up. Oh, my God. He was puking. Like, this was in the day room where we had a big TV, a communal area where you could watch TV and stuff. He was chugging away at this milk for an hour. About 45, 50 minutes in, he got about three quarters of the way down. He was in my bathroom puking his guts out and reluctantly had to pay the uh, $20. <laughs> but uh, the guy who made him the bet knew that, you know, nobody can take a gallon of milk in an hour. He's like, I could do that. It's like, no, you can't. It's like, no, no, I could do that. It's like, no, no, you physically can't. No, I can do that. That's easy. In the end, he couldn't. I love how the uh, put in the box guys in on it too. Mm -hmm. How many eggs does he have to eat again? Fifty. They said if he eats one a minute, he's got ten minutes left. Jesus, no. Oh, pain. Oh, God. Not even drinking anything to wash it down. 28 left. Yeah, look at that gut. Oof. 24 minutes? Oh, God, no, please, no more. Never <laughs> want to see an egg again. They're not even going down his throat anymore. They're just all lodged in there. Fuck. He's got nine more. Jesus Christ. Kill me. End it now. <laughs> be merciful, for God's sake. I'd rather be on death row. At least they kill me mercifully. Well... If they remember the sponge. <laughs> I take it without the sponge right now. That's true. Without the sponge, it only took that one guy like four minutes to die. Yeah. <laughs> He's been taking an hour. So is this a food eating scene or a rape scene? It's both. <laughs> Vomit, blah. explosion. <laughs> <laughs> he is dead. dead. Look, he's Jesus. <laughs> he performed a miracle. The, the crucifixion pose is definitely symbolic. He ate those <laughs> eggs for our sins. Oh, I thought he was making like a Moses joke or something. <laughs> but I realized he was actually missing his walking stick. Oh, yeah, because Moses turned his one staff into a, a snake. Mm. Yeah. It might I have believe... been. Good catch, Josh. I was raised Catholic. I may have been force fed the Bible a time or three. So they're putting him in the box? Your mother dies. It's a night in the box. <laughs> I was wondering why they make him wear that gown in the box, and then it just hit me why. Shitting? Well, <clears throat> probably two things. One, Yes, it's open at the bottom, so if they can't, like, shit themselves. And two, um, you can't, like, take your shoelaces out and hang yourself. Oh, I did not think of that one. 
<laughs> Ow, dog, you are going through barbed wire. You are dumb. Oh, God. The dog's just so stupid. Oh, my God, it's Sheriff J.W. Pepper. <laughs> it really is. It's the guy from the James Bond movies. No shit. Yeah. Like, he's really racist in Live and Let Live, and then he's just kind of an idiot in uh, The Man with the Golden Gun. But he's the same guy. Oh, Sheriff J.W. Pepper. Oh, <laughs> boo. Jesus Christ, the dog died? No, he ran himself to death. But still, they killed a dog in this movie. Boo. Man, we still got a half an hour left. A long movie. It's no green mile. Thank God for that much. That's better. Yep, I'm home. Thanks, I just needed to check out the ground. It was too far away. What an ass. I mean, who killed his dog? Ah! <laughs> Wait. Ah, I wonder if that's symbolism. Kind of like digging his own grave? Nah, that can't be it. Nah, definitely not. No, no. You guys are reading way too much into that. Hey, Midnight Special! <laughs> hey! <laughs> cool Hand Luke is a friend of the podcast. Hey, watch our show. Or listen to it anyways. A lot of our movies have made me realize that I don't want to go to prison. And I definitely don't want to go in the 60s. Definitely not. <laughs> so just out of spite, how many of y'all would just kept digging? Um, Honestly, I think at day two, I probably would have been like, you know what? They're going to kill me. So I'm going to use this shovel and I'm going to take at least one of them with me. Josh, what about you? Well, I probably wouldn't have been in prison to begin with. Now that's just cheating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's how I look whenever I'm trying to get to the toilet when I gotta take a deuce. <laughs> that's usually how I look after I've taken the deuce. You guys need more fiber. Um, delete that. How many animals died to make this film? Many. It was the 60s. What we got here is a failure to communicate. That escalated! So we've seen three prison films now. Oh, man. We need to watch that one with Schwarzenegger and Stallone where they break out. Because we need a... to see a prison movie that's not depressing, depressing as hell. Oh, shit, I'm not recording. <laughs> <laughs> and now, back to the episode. So what, he died? Um, it's implied. If he lived... Hey, he went to a whole different prison. I mean, they basically said, like, when they're taking him, like, yeah, he's not going to make it. It's an hour drive back to the prison. It's like, he's ours. And they said if they tried to escape again, they'd kill him. Yep. So he may have survived, but he only survived <laughs> until he died. I mean, that's technically how it goes for everyone, I guess. Yeah, that's not technically wrong. So we just watched The Legend of Cool Hand Luke. Oh, well, it's not really a legend, but you know what I mean. Okay, so when we start off, we meet Luke as he's paying off his parking meter. And by paying off, we mean chopping off the heads off the, all of the meters. So he's given a light two-year sentence on the Chang Gang, uh, which time he winds up pissing off George Kennedy who beats his ass, literally, and also in a game of poker. And after that, they become good friends. They run bets, they eat eggs, they watch people wash cars, and actually it's all good on the line until Luke gets word that his mom's died. But thankfully, the prison system in the South in the 1960s is a fair and understanding and humane system. So to help him through his suffering, they give him three days in the box, which is literally just a box in the southern heat. You know, just to motivate him from trying to escape. So he tries to escape. Makes it pretty far, but he's caught and firmly told, don't do it again. He does it again. Gets a little bit farther this time, but they do catch him. And they have a stern talking to. There's a failure to communicate and it's plates piled on, but he keeps digging down deep and eventually he rides it out. And in the end, proves that a losing hand is still a pretty cool hand. The end. That may have been your worst summary ever. I have to agree. I fell asleep during that. And it's yeah. not because I've been up for almost, you know, a lot longer than I would like to be. But because it was very, you know, boring. But, but it was short. No, not really. It was two minutes. 
That's one of my shortest summaries yet. You're right, you're right. I could do better. Okay, so the film starts with symbolism. No, it's okay. Vito. Symbology. Symbiology. It's a real word. Oh, my oh, Lord. As an English major, I'll allow You're it. The best word maker. The very best. Like no one ever was. But before we catch any more, I got to say, I still love this film. I actually forgot a couple things that happened in this movie. It surprised me, especially <laughs> the third escape he made. I completely forgot all about that. That was brilliant. Oh, my God. And the egg scene. I forgot how painful that was to watch. Such a good film. Personally, for me, the cinematography, the film had a very 70s feel to it. You know, that grounded style. There were some pretty brilliant cinematography moments, like especially when he's eating the eggs and he's just rocking back and forth and the camera just kind of rocks with him. Very nicely done. Nothing about it was exaggerated. There was no needless Dutch tilts or just overdone shots or anything like that. Just steady shots, letting everything sink in, letting you watch these people do what they were doing. And that just added to the grounded feel of this movie. You really felt bad the way they were feeling bad. Not in a beat you over the head with it sort of way like a lot of films did and do, especially prison films where it just makes it seem like a torture fest. And I appreciate that, especially having seen two other prison films that were kind of what you would consider nowadays typical prison films. Uh, Green Mile being the worst offender of that i mean i have one or two small like little things against the film the jesus imagery some of that what got a little heavy especially near the end but you know this was one of the earlier films that kind of did that sort of thing and other films have done it far more obvious and far worse so i'm not gonna it's not a uh, I'm not, it's not a sin against this film. I'm, those are my first initial thoughts. I'm sure I'll have some additional ones to add in or just like support everyone else's. But Josh, what about you? Did you ever remember if you've seen this film or not? No, I haven't. This is was a first for me. And there's a lot to unpack in this mm -hmm. film, especially being the first time viewing. But I have a lot of respect for the film in terms of, like you said, cinematography, the acting, the overall pace it didn't feel like it was overly too slow but at the same time it wasn't like the adhd roller coaster ride that is modern cinema but mm -hmm. uh I, I i did appreciate a lot of it like honestly it felt like to me and i know i mentioned this when we were watching it his escaping almost felt like it came out of nowhere i get his mother died they put him in the box for no reason and his combination of the two broke him and then he just started to run or as the warden said, put the rabbit blood in him. But overall, it was interesting, especially leading up to that point, because that was obviously some kind of a catalyst. But leading up to that point, there wasn't any real villains in the movie. Like, they kept kind of hinting that Glasses was a bad guy. But I like how they did it to where it's not like they were building him up to be this, like, epic bad guy you know like be careful of him he's gonna whoop your ass it was like there was nothing really sidearm it's just they had the subtle aspects of him shooting the head off the snake and shooting the bird out of the sky like he was a one-trick pony who's just there in the background and he's a presence but we know he's good at at least one thing but then when they finally show him do what he was supposed to be there Chekhov's rifle i guess if you want to put it literally he didn't kill him on the shot even though we all know he was perfectly capable of doing that because you know they'd shown that multiple times leading up to the movie he could have killed luke in the church scene at the very end had he wanted to but i like how they built him up but without overly exaggerating him i guess is the word they showed that he was dangerous yes but he was like that quiet subtle danger don't mess with the quiet guy because he's gonna fuck you up mm -hmm. but it's not like he was the one trick villain he could shoot, but we knew he was in charge. 
But there was no real other villains in this movie if outside of like the cops and the dogs or whatever. I mean, there wasn't really a single person to hate in this film because he had all the other bosses who was treating him like shit. And I would say that even the warden wasn't like overtly evil in this film because it's like they never showed the bosses being unnecessarily mean to any of them when they were acting good. Not yeah. like in uh, Shawshank Redemption or uh, Green Mile. So when he started acting up, it's like you could really see what they could be, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, even the one guy who at the beginning of the film, so like, you fart, that's a night in the box. Like, he was in on the whole 50 egg bet. It almost felt like everything leading up to his first escape was a movie. And then like, from his uh, mom dying to the end of the movie was like episode two, or it's just like part two. But it almost felt separated enough to where it was just like, where did this come from? It's like a bad sequel to a good movie or whatever. I, I don't even want to say that because that almost seems unjustified. But yeah, it definitely shows that Luke is, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. It's late. Luke is like a free spirit, maybe. Or a chaos factor. Um, chaos, a wild card. Yeah. It's like, I don't make a plan. I just do what I do. It's like, are you a joker? I, I did definitely enjoy the movie. I'd have to say it's one of those movies where it's like, if I was in a theater, I'd walk out of there and I'd be like, did I like that movie? But it's like, I did. I did like the movie. It's one of those ones. It's like, it's hard for me to really say it. It's like, I need a time to process this movie. But I think that's all I've got for now. Nigel, I think you're up. Hated it. All right. And that's it. Let's go ahead and do our closing <laughs> statements. <laughs> no, 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 no. This movie's definitely worthy of its classic status. Like, Agreed. it's. Oh, God, it was good. And while this movie is a Paul Newman vehicle, George Kennedy steals this movie. Like,. I don't know if this movie would be as good if George Kennedy hadn't played Dragline like he did. Like oh yeah, he definitely had the most character out of yeah, all of the characters. Yeah, like and, and that's not taken away from anything from like Paul Newman. He's a fantastic actor. But Kennedy really, really, really made this movie and really makes it enjoyable. That's just what I loved about it. It's another one of those movies that's just uh just there's like one or two characters you just kinda of latch on to. And you're kind of rooting for. It's been so long since I've seen the end of this movie that I knew Paul Newman's character is implied to have died, but I couldn't remember if George Kennedy lived through the rest of the movie. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I can't remember. Did they kill him? Like, oh, no. No, 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 no. I don't remember. I don't remember. The dog died, but I don't care. Is George Kennedy going to die in this movie? So tempted to Google. and But I didn't, and I'm glad I didn't. But I don't know. This is one of those movies that like everyone talks up. Everyone's like, it's, you know, well, it's got 100 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. And I'm um, just uh, I was just in awe of the movie. It just it was such a really good film. It, I got really depressing in the second <laughs> half of the film. Yeah, I, it kind of goes from uh, Shawshank kind of sort of mirrors it in a way, you know, because this movie comes before Shawshank. Mm -hmm. But both movies are similar in that the prisoner in, in in this case, um, Luke, in, in Shawshank's Andy, seems to be adapting well to prison life. Like, they're doing okay. They got friends. They got a role in the prison system. Like, you know, Luke was the lone guy and, and, the, and the guy that did the crazy bets. And Andy was the, the guy cooking the books, so to speak, for the prison warden. And they were kind of enjoying some privileges of being bigwigs in the prison. I guess, if, I don't know. I don't know prison hierarchy. I've never been inside. And then, like, something happens halfway through the film, and the films just take a complete turn and become, like, much darker and much more depressing. And this movie's in the same vein. Like, it seems like he's doing fine. Luke's, like, you know, after him and Dragline become best buds, it's like you're thinking, at least from Luke's point of view, hey, prison's not so bad. Yeah, working on the road sucks, but I get to play cards, and I get to sing songs and, and drink drinks and eat eggs and like it's not so bad and then his mom dies and they say we understand your grief and we're gonna throw you in the box because of it and th he goes to escape mode kind of like andy and shawshank as soon as andy tony. finds out huh mm -hmm. as soon as tony dies right uh yeah well yeah tony dies because tony tells him who actually killed his wife and he he tells the warden like you know hey i i think i can get out of here because i'm innocent actually and i can prove that i'm innocent and, and, and two and, months in the box he yeah. got two yeah he got two months in the box for his trouble although Shawshank implies that well it doesn't just imply it outright shows that Andy had been planning his escape pretty much from the first day he was there mm -hmm. whereas Cool Hand Luke 
Luke doesn't start actually trying to escape until after mom dies. And he's thrown in the box for his trouble. But yeah, it, it, I just forgot how depressing this movie gets at the end. And and this is one of them that's kind of like, huh, I'm not going to lie, guys. This has been a long road. <laughs> Getting from there to here. No, 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 no. Stop it. Stop it, Enterprise theme song. Stop it. This isn't a Star Trek film. Although no. there was a Star Trek character. There yeah. was a Star Trek character in the movie, and like I said, it's just it's this has been this has been a very difficult road because uh, most of our movies have been depressing. I can't remember how Flight of the Phoenix ends, but good God, I hope they rebuild that plane and get out of there. I've actually never seen the original Flight of the Phoenix, have I? I've only ever seen the remake. No, I've I've not seen any version of Flight of the Phoenix. Neither have I. It's going to be a new one for me too. And, and really, just hearing you guys talk, I think I will add one more slight grievance to the film, and that is the character of Luke and the fact that he had no motivation for what he did. One could imply that his whole parking meter destruction at the beginning of the film was because he found out his mom had cancer and just was acting out because of it. But that's only like a personal interpretation. It's never said. And some of his actions while he was in prison, like the betting, that's just him biding time, keeping morale going. But the rest, it would have been nice to have a little more depth to luke aside from like i'm just doing it to do it yeah you know? that, that that kind of threw me off i think josh actually mentioned while we were watching the movie like this prison break seems kind of sudden <laughs> like mm. it, it almost feels like they just kind of imply with the, the beginning of the movie of him cutting those uh, parking meters up and then like later on the conversation with his mom that he's always been a troublemaker even when he's getting checked into the prison like the prison warden straight says like you made your way all the way up to sergeant in the army during the war and you were decorated multiple times but then you got discharged as a private mm-hmm. which means he was a troublemaker in the army too it's almost like he was that kind of character that just can't stay out of trouble nowadays that would be considered lazy writing and if it had been written worse maybe it would have been because it didn't detract from him i mean the they could have overcorrected and given him too much backstory or made him too tragic or something along those lines And they didn't. So I'd rather have enough that you can make your own interpretations than too much. And it just like smashing you over the head with it's like, this is a Jesus metaphor. Although it kind of was, he didn't know his dad and, you know, he was betrayed by his closest friend. Although I don't remember Jesus eating 40 eggs in under an hour. One (laughs) of his lesser known miracles, I guess. It's in one of those books somewhere. Probably, probably one of the ones that's not canon. So I'm just saying it, it's a good movie and well worthy of its classic status. It's definitely a 60s movie. It, Josh said it doesn't have that uh, breakneck pace that modern cinema seems to have. But that doesn't t- take away from the fact it's a good film. Uh, yeah, really good. Would recommend. I'd watch it again. Not tomorrow because it's it's a sad movie and I kind of I need something happy to counterbalance this thing. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's good. especially the last three weeks have been kind of sad. <laughs> please, please fly to the Phoenix. Please build the plane and get off the island. Okay. We definitely need something more optimistic for our next road. Yeah, road although, road. yes, we do. I do have one thing. Like, I would have to agree with the critics in terms of, you know, the Rotten Tomatoes get, having a 100%. I definitely like this movie i would give it you know whatever the thumbs up Mm -hmm. but i definitely wouldn't say it's the best movie i've ever seen i can agree with that i can agree i think it's worthy of its classic status yeah it's definitely worthy of the classic status it's definitely not the best movie i've ever seen and i don't think it's a 10 out of 10 i I honestly would probably say and some people probably say this is blasphemy but i think i probably like shawshank better than i like this one in terms of prison movies yeah, I can see that. And honestly, I mean, and I don't want to sound blasphemous either. And, and we're, I don't know, we're probably going to lose subscribers for this, the six we have. This isn't even my favorite movie that we've watched in this podcast. Don't make, don't think that I'm, I'm saying. Yeah, oh, we're not bashing the movie. Yeah. We're definitely not going to be like, oh my God, you remember how terrible Cool Hand Luke was? Don't quote me on that. And so help me God. You get Tom, a sound bite of that. I will Tom, kill don't you. edit that out. Tom, don't edit that out. That's, oh. that's, that's ASMR. That's ASMR. <laughs> No, no, I really, I definitely liked it. I liked it more than probably majority of the movies we've watched. And it could just be one of those things. We're late on the uh, bandwagon, so it's like, we're like, what's the appeal again? 
Yeah, that's another point, too. It's like there have been so many other prison films made since Cool Hand Luke that have built on the foundation. Mm -hmm. It's set. So, of course, we're going to look at this one like, eh, I've seen better. Like, oh, yeah, because it's like I, I said, it's like I think that the character of Luke, like, I don't think I said it during my final thoughts, but I definitely felt like he was kind of bland. Like I said, it would be lazy writing if they wrote a character like that today. I mean, I thought he did a great job in it. But I mean, he's just like, you know, his James Dean Rebel Without a Cause. And I'm quoting that movie having never seen it because I know it's one of those things that everybody quotes it. And I've seen the examples and the examples of it, of the parodies and everything. Mm -hmm. But he's like very much uh, no background, silent character, only speaks when he's got something clever to say type character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rebel Without a Cause. It's just I feel like he's very kind of a bland character. But I thought that it was very fitting for the movie. Yeah. And it, again, like what Dan said. I felt George Kennedy's character really made the film because he was one of the few characters who had a character, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, he did. He did. I know this is a Paul Newman movie, but like George Kennedy, I can see why he won the Oscar that year mm -hmm. for, for yeah. Best Supporting Actor. I can definitely see why George Kennedy oh, yeah. won the Oscar that year. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, he did a fantastic job. And I have to say, of he's definitely had the most memorable uh, role. And he definitely mm -hmm. made the movie a lot more fun. I remember I absolutely loved watching him go from the villain to the friend, you know? And I will say I can see why George Kennedy won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for that year. And I can see why Paul Newman didn't win the Oscar for exactly. Best Actor. I, I agree with both of your thoughts on this one. It's just, I'll, I'll add to the chorus here, good film, boarding on a great film, but not the best film. Definitely not the best film we've seen so far, which have been quite a few. This is our 30th episode and we have seen enough films of the spectrum that we can watch a movie like Cool Hand Luke and go, it was good, but not the best one we've seen so far. But yeah, it's oh, like okay. we understand the legacy. We understand the impact, you know, how good it is. We, we, see, we see what made it popular. I just Googled Oscar winners in 1968. And uh, that was some stiff competition for uh, best actor in a lead role. Rod Steiger actually won it for In the Heat of the Night, which, if you guys have ever seen that movie, is an amazing film. Oh. Um, that, that's the movie, not the TV show that was based on the movie. That's the Sidney Poitier movie. Mm -hmm. right? movie. Um, but the other nominees were Warren Beatty for Bonnie and Clyde, Dustin Hoffman for The Graduate, Paul Newman for Cool Hand Luke, and Spencer Tracy in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. All of those movies are good movies. Like, Did they really all come out the same yeah, year? Like, Damn. All of those movies are good movies. And then, like, here's George Kennedy won Best Supporting Actor in a role, or Best Actor in a Supporting Role. So George Kennedy wins Cool Hand Luke. The other nominees were John Cassavetes for The Dirty Dozen, Gene Hackman, also in Bonnie and Clyde, Cecil Kellaway in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and Michael J. Pollard, in, in, again, in Bonnie and Clyde. Like, holy shit. Wowzers. Take, take a bow, George Kennedy. You beat out some hella competition. I mean, I can't believe, like, every one of those movies is amazing. Like, if that was a road <laughs> that we had to do, that would be awesome. Like, In the mm. Heat of the Night, Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate, Cool Hand Luke, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Like, wow. Almost all of those could either be destination films or definitely movies on a road somewhere. So, yeah. But that's just my side tangent. I, I had to see who won Best Support or Best Actor that year. Like, oh, okay. Well, I mean, Paul Newman didn't win, but it's not like he lost to a scrub. <laughs> <It's> like, yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. Oh, wowzers. That's impressive. But considering this film still stands out against all of that and made the money it did against all of those heavy hitters, damn. One of these days, we'll have to circle back in 1967 and see what else they have for us. For, for now, I think we have a plane to catch. Am I right, fellas? Yeah, so bots and listeners, that was Cool Hand Luke. Just as a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, wherever you prefer to get podcasts. Be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps our uh, show grow. And please join our Discord. Links in the episode description and at our page, firepit.podbean.com. We love act the conversations that we're having with our current listeners who partake there. And we're currently having polls for the election season coming up. So please hop on there. Say hi. Yeah. I'm falling asleep right here. Join the Discord so Josh is a little more peppy. <laughs> 
But if you didn't catch all of that, you can still email us for the show, as mentioned in the interspersal segment. As a reminder, we also have a Facebook and a Twitter page now. Links can be found where else? In the episode's description on firepit.podbean.com. Yes, thank you, Tom. And as always, a special shout out to Peggy, the real, real, I cannot emphasize that enough, real OG friend of the show. Emphasizing it doesn't really give it a lot of credit. We love you, Peggy. I love you. They may not, but I do. Special shout out, Peggy, OG friend of the show. And a special shout out to my brother, who recently had a birthday this past week, and my other brother, who recently joined our Facebook page. So you guys are my blood, so you better start at least putting this on in the background to help our numbers. And also a shout out to Josh, co-host of the Fire Pit, who also had a birthday. Hey, happy birthday, Josh. You're old now. I am. I'm I'm getting closer and closer to being ancient like you two. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, happy birthday to Tony. And Dan, love you like a brother. Joe, you could always do a little bit better. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and do some name drops for some of our other firsts. Brad Boys was our 100th listener. Larry was our 300th. And Tarek Thorne was our first Discord member. So thank you again for listening. We really appreciate it. And Tarek Thorne, we love chatting with you on our Discord. And I'd just like to give a shout out to all of our past, present, and future listeners. Those that have joined us on the Discord and Facebook. Those that are just now discovering it. And those that are just listening in the background. Uh, We appreciate it more than we can say. And we hope that we're entertaining, or at least educational, or at least something to have going on. Thank you much, and thank you some more. Yeah. It's really late right now, so (laughs) all words not make function out mouth. Well put, Josh. Thank you so much. And that wraps up Dennis Hopper and Cool Hand Luke. Tune in next week as we hit the penultimate stop on the Whistle Stop campaign trail to Washington. And uh, Josh, if you're still kind of awake, who are we following next week? Well, Tom, next week we are following (laughs) George Kennedy to the original Flight of the Phoenix, starring one Stuart Jimmy. Dan? Close enough. Honestly, I'm really looking forward to that one. I'm going in completely blind. I'm flying blind, if you will, into next week. But until then, bots and listeners, I've been Tom. And I've been Dan. And I've been also Dan. (laughs) Real Dan. (laughs) That was Josh. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. Dick. A hairy dick. What is that? That's another dick. Fitting. It's just... It's just... God damn it! They're all dicks! You're all dicks! Vote for me!